to the cloud. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, I apologize for forgetting to press record. We started uh, back here on the bottom of page, um, uh, bottom of page 72. Uh, it seems pretty straightforward. So I didn't really elaborate that much. The Gemara is just arguing about what level of specificity needs to be um, mentioned by the Gentile when selling a particular object to the Gentile. How specific does he have to be that it's being used for idol worship when it becomes prohibited to sell? So we're up to the, uh, and, and if it's, um, and then the argument is why does the Mishnah need to teach it? It seems pretty obvious. And as for the objection that this ruling is superfluous, in fact, it is necessary for the Mishnah to state the halacha in a case where he specified that he would use the item for idol worship. The Gemara elaborates, it might enter your mind to say that this man does not really need the wheat for his idol worship. Rather, he is deeply attached to idol worship, and he thought that just as that man, that is, he himself is so attached to it, everyone else is also attached to idol worship. Therefore, he reasoned, I will say this, that I intend to use the item for idol worship so that they will give it to me. Consequently, it's necessary for the Mishnah to teach us that if he says that he intends to use the item for idol worship, it is prohibited to sell it to him as he might be telling the truth. So I'm not sure I understand that argument. So you know, I'm going to read this again and see if I... Um, it might enter your mind to say that this man does not really need the wheat for his idol worship. Rather, he's deeply attached to idol worship, and he thought that just as that man is so attached to it, everyone else is also attached to idol worship. Therefore, he reasoned, I will say this, that I intend to use the item for idol worship so that they will give it to me. Consequently, it's necessary for the Mishnah to teach us that if he says that he intends to use the item for idol worship, it's prohibited to sell it to him as he might be telling the truth. So um, I, I, I'm not, I, I really don't get this. I don't get this line of reasoning here because you're not supposed to sell something if clearly the, the guy is going to be using it for idol worship. So I, I'm not sure I understand the game that they think this Gentile is playing and what it has to do here with selling or not selling. I think I get it. Yeah, Michael, uh, and then um, Arnie. I, I think Michael I first. get this. Um, yeah. I, I remember um, on, uh, the reason, well, anyway, these, these, there, there's this in, investor, uh, real estate investor session that I was uh, involved in. And, and this one guy's telling people uh, how to, to write a contract and he goes, you know, you might want to, to let the seller know or to make them think that you want to live in the property because uh, they would be more inclined to sell it to you uh, if they thought you were going to live there because, you know, they they come from a background of, of, of living in a house that you buy and they'd be more entitled to it likely to sell it to you if they thought you were coming from the same background. It's a little bit of Ganevish shtick that I don't think is very nice. But I think the idea is, is this guy wants to convince the seller that they should sell to him because they both come from the same community and therefore uh, he, he, he's being honest uh, in that sense because he's trying to, to get the merchant who, who doesn't realize is Jewish, he thinks is also an idol worshiper, to be sure to sell to him so he'll get the stuff. Yeah, uh, so, it, so maybe, maybe the the buyer thinks that the seller is not Jewish. Yeah. Uh, so maybe, maybe that's what this paragraph is saying. Arnie, what do you think? Yeah, that that's actually related to what I had wanted to say. Uh -huh, it uh -huh. seems to me that you know, the the most people would be able to recognize a Jewish person. They they might have a beard. They might have had their hair covered. They might. You know they they might dress differently most likely do so that's why this doesn't make sense to me that it's very i don't i don't especially also in small communities everybody knew who was what what they are i believe that yes i think so 
So, so, so you know, I, I, that's why it doesn't make sense to me either, because right. I think that if you wanted to try to convince a Jewish person that, you, you know, you, you, you know, that you would say you're going to use something right. for idol worship, that's, that's a dumb thing to do. Right. That's <laughs> well, right. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure that in the time of the rabbis in Babylonia, that the Jews dressed differently from their non-Jewish neighbors. I'm not so sure. I don't remember learning about any distinctive Jewish style of dress uh, at that time. There's certainly later on, uh, we know that in the Middle Ages that we the Jews were required to dress differently, or at least have a mark that distinguished them as uh, as Jews. But I don't think that that was the case. So, so that's one thing. So the, the Jews may not have looked different from their neighbors. Also, now that in terms of uh, maybe facial characteristics or whatnot, I don't know if Babylonians were dark skinned and Jews were light skinned. I don't know if that was a case uh, or if there's something else about facial features because uh, Jews from Arab countries and Arabs do look alike so that that's for sure jews from ashkenazi countries do look uh, f f uh, most jews do look different from their non-jewish neighbors right so you know it's what hitler was talking about the aryan blonde hair blue-eyed um german certainly look different than the curly-haired a uh, short, uh, big-nosed Jew, okay? So, um, uh, but in Arab countries, uh, Jews tended to look like their Arab neighbors. Um, but then to the other point, don't you think if it's a small town, everybody knows who everybody is? So that, I think that point still stands, and unless it's a traveling uh market yeah. right yeah. where the uh, the people aren't it's not a regular vendor that's there every day or every week it could be somebody else coming in so i don't know there's some some points here that just don't seem to make sense to me jesse um i think it kind of does make sense i think maybe the seller is trying to rationalize selling it to the uh <laughs> selling it to the customer yeah. And um, the customer says, uh, no, 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 I need it. But, you know, you want to sell it to him and you say, no, 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 he really doesn't need it. And that would, uh, I mean, that, that could become the rationale for selling it to him. If in your own mind, you think he's just, you know, <laughs> if, if in your own mind, you think that he's, uh, that he doesn't need it. Uh -huh. Isn't that what it's saying? I, you, I you don't think, I think it. he's you saying want that he it. wants to. I yeah, think it says know. here in the paragraph, he himself is so attached to it, everyone else is also attached to idol worship. So yeah, like he's yeah. pretending to to uh, want it for idol worship because everybody else is, is, is doing idol worship. But I don't know how that will convince the Jew to sell it to him because we're told you're not allowed to sell things for idol worship. Well, so. think, about, think about if you're a fence on 47th Street uh and yeah. people bring merchandise to you to um uh the stolen merchandise but you don't want to believe that it's really stolen merchandise even though the individual says oh you know i i just went into a cvs and i scooped up uh, handfuls of this uh this facial cream and you really want you're greedy enough that you really really want the stolen merchandise so you can turn it over for a big profit so, you know, you're kind of having this argument with yourself and you may tend to ignore the fact that the person says that it's stolen if you really want to buy it from them. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm just, uh, that could be, I mean, it makes sense. I'm just, I'm just not sure I see it in the words that are here on the page. Um, but I, I, I understand completely what you're saying and that does make sense. So. Let's just go on. Um, Ravashi raised a dilemma. If a Gentile asks the merchants, who has a damaged white rooster? What is the halacha with regard to whether it's permitted to sell him an unblemished white rooster? 
right? We we learned in the in the Mishnah and the and the conversation about the rooster that you're allowed to damage the white rooster and sell it because you know that damaged uh, animals, birds, can't be offered for sacrifice. So there, it should be okay. So uh, if the seller, if the buyer wants to buy a white rooster, a damaged white rooster, is it okay? Uh, wait, who has a damaged white rooster? What is the halacha with regard to whether it's permitted to sell him an unblemished one? Oh, he wants, an, he wants a blemished one, but you only have an unblemished one. So the buyer says, I want an unblemished one, which could... Uh, which could give the impression he wants something not for idol worship. Then are you allowed to sell him something that could be used for idol worship? Right? So the buyer starts with the intention seemingly to buy an animal that you know can't be used for idol worship. Can you then sell him something that could be used for idol worship? Right? So we get it. So, do we say that from the fact that he says that he wants a damaged rooster, it may be inferred that he does not need it for idol worship, as Gentiles do not sacrifice defective animals, and therefore it's permitted, right? So in other words, because he's saying that he wants a defective one, it's okay to sell him a non-defective one because he's not intending to, to, sell, to use it for idol worship. Or perhaps he is only employing artifice, in other words, he knows that a Jew will not sell him an undamaged white rooster upon request. And as it's unlikely that someone has a damaged white rooster to sell him, he hopes that he'll receive an undamaged one. If so, it's prohibited to sell him a white rooster. So here it gets to uh, 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 it gets to a level of whether you can trust a Gentile at all. Okay, so... Perhaps, so in other words, you're not, there's no asking, there's, there's no um, possibility raised here that there's a conversation taking place between the Jewish seller and the Gentile buyer as to what the buyer intends to do with the bird, okay? So in other words, let's say Michael is the Gentile. He, he um, so am I supposed to have a conversation with him about what he intends to do it with, what he intends to do with the thing? Because the, Michael will say, what do you care? I have the money here. I'm buy, I wanna, you have this thing for sale. I want to buy it from you. What difference does it make what I'm going to be doing with it? And, he, and then he could just go to the next stall and buy what he wants. So having a conversation like this, could jeopardize the uh, opportunities for sale. So it's all about if if uh, Michael says something on his own, then if he does, are is the Jewish merchant allowed to believe him or not regarding this particular item that could be used for idol worship right so it's we're not talking about things that can't be used for idol worship well we kind of i'm sorry we are we're talking about an unblemished a blemished white rooster so is he lying and saying i want an unblemished white rooster knowing you only have a an unblemished one and therefore you you still can't sell him the unblemished one because he's only lying because he really wanted the unblemished one and he's going to use it for for idol worship. So the, it seems Rav Ashi is saying that uh, you can't believe the Gentile in uh, what he says. And this gets to, uh, this, this uh, leads us further down the slippery slope in terms of being able to do business with, not, with our non-Jewish neighbors. So if you can't trust what they say, then essentially it it severely limits the kind of business relationships you can have with non-Jews. So, oh. yeah. It's just an interesting thought. I mean, if, if you broaden this out just generally, 
Um, the Eusters being used for arguably for an immoral purpose or for a wrong purpose. Yeah. What if you're a Jewish or, or what if you're a gun merchant in Idaho where you could be selling to a guy who wants to go hunting or you could be selling to, you know, one of these nuts who live up there and who, who want to participate in a, uh, uh, a, a revolt against the government or whatever. It's just an interest. Well, it's so just that's an interesting. Do you believe the person who tells you this? Right. Well, so that, but that, that gets to another thing about, you know, it's not illegal to sell roosters. Oh, yeah. Okay. The, the question is about uh, being involved in in a sale that is legal but could be questionably ethical mm -hmm. right so it's it's legal to sell guns in america and i believe every single state in the country you can buy a gun but it has different rules of course about how to do it but then the question is should jews be allowed to be gun merchants because the Jew will know that the gun is being used. Okay, it's one thing if it's being used in self-defense. Uh, according to the Talmud and, and according to the Torah, uh, self-defense is perfectly ethical and moral and, and, and religious. That's fine. But if you're using, if you know the gun's going to be used for hunting, which is against Jewish law, and certainly if it's going to be used for illegal purposes should a jew even get involved in that business knowing there's some or what about jews who own liquor stores okay now there are there are people who are not alcoholic who are not alcoholics who buy alcohol just for you know a party every now and then or something like that sure. but uh, another uh, would uh, is should a Jew be engaging in that kind of business, knowing that there could be alcoholics who are buying um, buying stuff from your store, and you are um, encouraging right? You are placing a stumbling block before the blind in that you are uh, enabling an alcoholic to continue with their so that so that that's that's a whole other area that the Gemara, I think, does discuss in, in, in one of the Babas, Baba Kama, Mitzia, or Batra, about this kind of sale um, and, and engaging in this kind of business practice. Here, it's pretty clear. Idol worship, you're not supposed to engage in it, and you're not supposed to encourage the sale of it, but there's this, there's, there are gray areas are what what do we do with the gray areas and here ravashi is trying to eliminate the gray area by saying you don't trust the gentile at all do not sell white roosters to them no matter what they say david yeah i think we we had a case recently in the country where it was a baker doesn't want yes to that's it. right yeah yeah right so is the baker allowed the wedding cake baker allowed not to sell to a gay couple for their for their wedding right and uh supreme's court said uh that's fine he doesn't have to so yeah um yeah but i think you know well it's also you know uh what about holy cross hospital which is a catholic hospital are they allowed to uh to do abortions right or to do um end of life issues that maybe um a catholic priest would say once you're on a ventilator you stay on a ventilator whereas medical practice would say a family can decide to take uh, a person off a ventilator so you know i don't i don't know what I don't know the ins and outs of Holy Cross Hospital being a Catholic hospital, um, but I believe they follow the the laws of the state of Maryland and they have will. to and have they to will. do it that way, right? So, but I, I would say that in certain states in the country, you have to be careful uh, what you're doing and what kind of business you want to, uh, and you know, it's like uh, buyer beware. So, okay. Um, 
So the, the conversation goes on. Rav Ashi saying, don't believe the Gentile, what he says, might be engaging, employing artifice. If you say that this Gentile is employing artifice, and it is prohibited in a case where he said, Who's, who has a white rooster, who has a white rooster, and they brought him a black rooster and he took it, or in a case where they brought him a red one and he took it, what is the halacha with regard to whether it's permitted to sell him a white rooster? So, in other words, he says he wants a white rooster, but he'll settle for anything. Are you then allowed to sell him a white rooster? Do we say, since they brought him a black rooster and he took it, or they brought him a red one and he took it, evidently he doesn't need the rooster for idol worship. Or perhaps here too he's employing artifice. The Gemara comments, these dilemmas shall stand unresolved. So teku is the word here, uh, which is usually understood that you wait for Elijah to come to settle this argument. So we don't know. Here, it seems like from what he's saying, he'll settle, even though he's saying he wants a right white rooster, he's settling for anything. So then you should be able to sell him a white rooster because he doesn't care. Or even then, he's still employing artifice and he's going to use that white rooster for idol worship. So we don't know. So the last part of the Mishnah uh, was about these palm trees. So the Mishnah teaches that Rabbi Meir says, it's prohibited to sell even a good palm tree and chatzav to Gentiles. I have to um, take this phone call. It's about a funeral that I have yeah. tomorrow. No, no, it's okay. You okay, Jess? Yeah. You get it to stop? No, he had to take a phone call. He has a funeral tomorrow. Mm. Sorry about that. Um, I have a funeral tomorrow, and I just had to take that call. Um, okay. The Mishnah teaches that Rabbi Mayer says it's uh, prohibited to sell even a good palm tree and the chatzav to Gentiles. Rav Chista said to Avi May, it is learned as a tradition that the tractate of Odazara of our forefather Abraham contained 400 chapters. Uh, so we're just stopping here for a second. We're studying the tractate of Odazara right now. Okay, so there's a tradition that uh, what, what uh, Rav Chista is talking about is that the rabbis think that they're, uh, what, what they are studying, so Rav Chista being in the first generation of rabbis of the Talmud. So uh, there's the Mishnah from 100 BCE until 200 CE, and then there's the Gemara, 200 CE to 500 CE. The rabbis think that as a 
as an ideological perspective that what they're studying is not created by them, but rather was passed down what was, was even studied by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a yeshiva that was established by Noah's son and grandson. Okay, so that just in order to project the idea that the rabbis aren't creating Jewish law out of whole cloth, but rather uh, only uh, bringing forward a tradition that has been there as old as the Torah itself. Okay, so it's it's like um, it's like um, Joseph Smith in New York finding the uh, gold tablets. Um, uh, that are the, the make up the Book of Mormon to say that he didn't he didn't uh, he didn't write these tablets himself, but rather it goes back to ancient times to the to the tribes of Israel, right? To to try to prove that Mormonism is not a brand new religion. So the rabbis are doing the same thing to prove that their interpretations of the Torah and uh, their teachings in the Mishnah were not brand new, but rather um, uncovered from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so Rav Chista said to Avime, it is learned as a tradition that the tractate Avodah Zarah of our forefather Abraham contained 400 chapters, and we have learned only five chapters in our tractate Avodah Zarah, and we do not even know the meaning of what we are saying. Avime asked him, and what in the Mishnah here poses a difficulty for you? He replied, I do not understand the Mishnah which teaches the following. Rabbi Meir says it is prohibited to sell even a good palm tree, chatzav and naklas, to Gentiles. It may be inferred from here that it is a good palm tree that one does not sell to Gentiles, but one may sell a bad palm tree. But didn't we learn in another Mishnah on 19b, which is up ahead, we're on 14b, uh, that one may not sell to Gentiles anything that is attached to the ground? Avime said to him, what is the meaning of a good palm tree? It means that the, the detached fruit of a good palm tree. And similarly, Rav Huna says the Mishnah means the fruit of a good palm tree. So it's not the palm tree itself, but rather the fruit of the palm tree that, um, that uh, Rabbi Meir is talking about. And here's a picture of dates from uh, this particular palm tree. Okay, so and then it's going to elaborate. The Gemara explains the meaning of other terms that appear in the Mishnah. Chatzav is a type of date known as Kashba. Okay, that helps, uh, being sarcastic. Um, with regard to the meaning of Naklas, the Gemara relates, when Rav Dimi came from Eretz Yisrael to Babylonia, he said that Rabbi Chama Bar Yosef said that it is re referring to Koreyate. Abaye said to Rav Dimi, we learned in the Mishnah Naklas, and we did not know what it is. And now you have said that it means Koreyate, and we do not know what that is either. How have you helped us? Rav Dimi said to him, I have in fact helped you, as when you go there to Eretz Yisrael and say to them Naklas, and they do not know what it means, say to them Koreyate, and they will know what it is, and they will show it to you. <laughs> okay, so maybe... This is a picture of the Koreate date. Um, right, so, okay. And then here, so in language here, it, it explains the different uh, kinds of dates that they're talking about. Okay. Um, looks like something for Tu Bishvat, right? Uh, exactly, <laughs> Tu Bishvat's coming, right? It's Rosh Chodesh tomorrow, so it's two weeks from uh, tomorrow. And um, yeah, so uh, that, yeah, we can have a specific Talmud class Tubishvat Seder by having by asking for Koreate dates and Chatzav dates, right? And see see where that that would go into some ultra orthodox neighborhood and see how impressed see if they know what we're referring to and how impressed they would be that we know Avodah Zarah page fourteen B, uh, Jesse. 
Uh, the the uh, the lines on the previous page that leave the lines on this page at the top seem yeah. almost, almost seditious. You know, where where somebody's throwing up his hands. Who is it? Uh, the, 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 uh because yeah, they don't know what. Yes. What the heck? What the heck is going on here? And right, you know, the, none of this makes sense to us. Right. It's it's a, a expression of impatience or frustration that uh, you don't. I don't recall seeing before. So, uh, but the frustration is, uh, let's turn the frustration on its head by saying, huh, how do we not understand the stuff that we wrote ourselves? Oh, <laughs> let's, let's say we don't understand it because we forgot what it meant because it was taught a thousand years ago and we forgot the meaning since then. So there's turning the, the, the not understanding all around by saying, oh, it's, it's, it's from ancient times and we've lost the meaning uh, since then. Uh, David, you still have your hand up. Uh, do, you still, do you have a question or you just didn't put the hand down from before? Okay. Sorry, Sorry. hand going down. Okay, that's fine. I just I just want to give you the opportunity. Um, okay, so now a, um, a new Mishnah. In a place where the residents were accustomed to sell small domesticated animals to Gentiles, one may sell them. In a place where they were not accustomed to sell them, one may not sell them. But in every place, one may not sell them large livestock calves or foals, whether these animals are whole or damaged. The sages prohibited these sales lest a Jew's animal perform labor for the Gentile on Shabbat in violation of an explicit Torah prohibition, as explained in the Gemara. Rabbi Yehuda permits the sale of a damaged animal because it is incapable of performing labor and Ben Batera permits the sale of a horse for riding because riding a horse on Shabbat is not prohibited by Torah law. Okay, so before we start the Gemara, my, my thinking is once you sell an animal, it's not yours anymore. So what difference does it make if it's going to be used on Shabbat or not? So the, I think what the Mishnah is saying once an animal is yours, it's considered Jewish. And you cannot, so it's just interesting to me. So uh, uh, what, what I'm thinking as I'm saying this is a Jew who converts to Christianity, for example, is still considered a Jew. And that the conversion to Christianity doesn't count, no matter how much the Jew might have wanted to, to, to convert to Christianity or not. So once a Jew, always a Jew. And it's uh, fascinating to me that they're saying once an animal is owned by a Jew, it is considered a, a Jewish. So it's like the category, ma'alin bakodesh ve'en moridin. You raise something out, up in you raise something up in holiness, but you cannot bring it down. So the the animal has been raised in holiness, in that it is granted a day off, because the the Ten Commandments, uh, teaching the the fourth of the Ten Commandments about Shabbat says your animals are not supposed to work on Shabbat. Okay, now riding a horse is not included in um in that commandment specifically it's it's more uh plowing a field that kind of work so that's what the mishnah means here that riding a horse on shabbat is rabbinic not torah in origin but the idea is an animal once it's owned by a jew cannot be sold to a non-jew unless maybe um um, the animal's damaged and it can't do work anymore, then you can sell it to a non-Jew. Yes, Jesse. You're, you're muted. Uh, nope. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there you go. Better. Um, this idea of the inalienability of Judaism uh, pertains to the idea of conversion, doesn't it? 
And you know, I'm, yes. reminded, I'm reminded that during the Inquisition, um, Jew, converted Jews were viewed as inauthentic converts and persecuted because right. Gentiles viewed them as, you know, that Jews in their own mind believed in inalienability. So whatever they said in the secular world was not right. to be trusted. They viewed themselves as Jews regardless. Is right. That, is that about right? Yes. Uh, and it's not just in the Inquisition. Uh, Lenore and I saw a play during winter break on Broadway, Leopoldstadt. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, so Leopold Stott, written by Tom Stoppard. Um, it's, it's a semi-autobiographical play. And um, he writes about, a, uh, the play is about an extended Jewish family in Vienna uh, over the course of 1899 to 1955. And uh, one of the members of the family converted to Christianity and all of the members of the family are pictured at one point in the um, in the play as gathered around the Passover Seder table. And even the Jew <clears throat> who converted to Christianity is sitting around the Seder table participating. And there's uh, another member of the family, a Jew, married to a Christian woman. So, um, and she's sitting around the table too, and it's all understood uh, there how uh, the Austrians um, still, just like the, the Christians in Spain, uh, look down upon um, or question the authenticity of conversion to Catholicism in medieval Spain, so too Austrians look down on uh, the Jews who converted to Christianity um, in order to get ahead. I mean, the, the classic example is Mahler, who uh, converted in order to get the job as the music director of the Viennese opera. So uh, it, it, that, <clears throat> that conversion enabled him to get the job, but everybody in Austria knew he was still Jewish. So uh, even though he himself wouldn't have walked into a synagogue again, and, uh, maybe even went to church. So uh, it just shows the, the Jewish dilemma of how, how much you want to try to be part of the, uh, the, the bigger society in order to save yourself, and how no matter what you do, you're still going to be seen as a Jew. So, um, yeah, but here... This is um, this is more about the uh, inherent sense of um, holiness that a Jew has, and even Jewish-owned animals have. Once once an animal has been acquired by a Jew, then the animal takes on that Jewish holiness by uh by uh, having shabbat and the fact that it has shabbat it can no longer be tainted by not having shabbat anymore so just fascinating fascinating to me how what the, this what how the uh the rabbis apply this concept to, to animals okay so let's read uh, a little bit in the gemara about this the mishnah teaches that one may not sell small domesticated animals to Gentiles if it's not a, the accepted practice. The Gemara infers. That is to say that there is no prohibition involved. Rather, there is a custom not to sell small dom domesticated animals, right? So in other words, it's a, if it's in a place where they don't do it, you don't do it. But if it's a place that you do do it, you can do it. So therefore, it's permitted, and it's only custom that pro that prohibits it in some places, right? So if, if it were a law not to sell domesticated animals, then some communities wouldn't have the out to, to sell because it's a prohibition. So therefore, where the practice is to prohibit the sale, that is what is practiced. And where the practice is permitted is to permit the sale, that is what is practiced. And the Gemara raises a contradiction from the Mishnah on 22a. So again, we're just about on 15a, so seven pages ahead 
uh, there's a contradiction. One may not keep an animal in the inns of Gentiles because they are suspected of engaging in bestiality. I happen to know this is the start of chapter 2 of Avodah Zarah, which I'm studying with my friend, Rabbi Ethan Seidel. So it's, um, <clears throat> it's not just about idol worship that you are worried about with Gentiles. It's also this, um, that uh, Gentiles you suspect of bestiality, uh, and you know, well, you assume that Jews do not engage in that, because the Torah is pretty specific. Uh, in Leviticus 18, Michael's very familiar with it because he reads it on Yom Kippur afternoon for us as the Torah reading. It's one of the it's one of illicit uh, sexual acts uh, that is forbidden. So you cannot uh, sorry if you're not you you cannot keep an animal in the inns of Gentiles because they are suspected of engaging in bestiality. In other words, you're traveling with your animal. Don't stop at a Gentile inn overnight because um, you might be providing uh, entertainment for the Gentile uh, with your animal, and therefore you are, um, you are violating Torah law by doing that. If so, so if, if you're not allowed to keep an animal in the end of a Gentile because of bestiality. If so, it should be prohibited in all places to sell animals to Gentiles, as one is thereby placing a stumbling block before the blind. Right, so it doesn't matter whether the animal is damaged or not. The issue isn't about whether the animal, yeah, well, no, the issue still is that, that about holiness, but it's not just about labor that you're worried about, about the animal violating Shabbat, but it's also about this about bestiality. <clears throat> Rav says the halacha of the Mishnah there with regard to keeping an animal in a Gentile inn is contingent on the halacha of the Mishnah here. If it is a place where the sages permitted one to sell animals to Gentiles, it must be that the Gentiles of that location are not suspected of engaging in bestiality. Therefore, the sages permitted one to leave the animal in seclusion with the Gentile at the inn. Conversely, in a place where the sages prohibited one from leaving the animal in seclusion with the Gentile at the inn, because the Gentiles there are suspected of engaging in bestiality, they are also prohibited. They also prohibited one from selling animals to Gentiles there. So, if it's a place that has a reputation of this kind of behavior, then you clearly cannot sell animals to those Gentiles. But if it's a place that doesn't have that reputation, then it's okay. I don't know how one knows about these reputations and learns about them, but I guess word spreads. Lori. I was just wondering if that practice was connected in any way to some forms of idol worship. No, no. It seems from chapter two that it's just, it's just what Gentiles do. And so I don't know if it's based on fact or it's it's a uh, a prejudice or a stereotype that is applied to to Gentiles. Uh, God forbid, and I don't mean anything disparaging, but it's it's like the the stereotypes of black people that all black people um, um, I don't even want to say it. Stereotypes about black people, so obviously not based in fact. Um, so is this a stereotype of Gentiles that they, they do this, even though they don't, but it's just to show how terrible Gentiles are. So that could be, that could be part of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Well, you going to say something else, Lori? No, no, that's it. Oh, okay. That's okay. Uh, Arnie. I, I just wanted to share a quick story. I hope I, I don't take about one minute. I, 30 years ago. I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers and my boss was named John Corbell. Okay. Nobody knows that name, but his sister uh, was Madeline Corbell Albright. Oh. Was Secretary of State. And yeah. it was, the news, the information about her parents actually being Jewish yeah. came out right about that time. I was sitting in a meeting saying, oh, I can't make such and such a thing because it's Passover. And yeah. John said, well, maybe I should be doing that. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, he did tell me under the table or another time that both he and his sister were, you know, just completely 
aghast at the information and right. and began to start feeling Jewish. That's interesting. Interesting. Just to share that. Okay. Yeah. So right. Should... Now it's interesting. So yeah, once once Jewish, always Jewish. But yeah, um, Jesse. Now you're you're muted, Jesse. Okay. Um, that uh, I mean, there seems to be no crime that uh, Gentiles are not assumed to engage in. Um, but right. with, reg with regard to, the, I mean, these are not just rumors. Once they're embedded in the Talmud, they no longer become rumors any more than the stereotypes that you refer to regarding black right. people. That's right. Embedded in law, in you know, in secular right. law. So. Right. So even if it's just a rumor, it suddenly becomes legitimized by its inclusion in the text. And I would say also it, it carries down today, too, so that in some segments of the Jewish community, there's still a disparagement of non-Jews. And people don't want to have any business with non-Jews, don't want to, don't want to be around non-Jews because they don't want to be contaminated by what they're learning in the Gemara about what non-Jews do. So it's still it's still like that today. Michael? Well, just just sort of historically, since the Torah mentions is one of the reasons why the Jews are taking over the land of Canaan, that because of practices like this, the population that, that was there is being expelled. Right. So it would seem that there was a historical, you know, antecedent to maybe the idea. Maybe we don't know. At some yes. point or another. Yeah. And um now whether it was still common in the days of the rabbis, I don't know. Right. But at least historically, there seems to be a reason for yes. what they're saying. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So in other words, uh, you could say it this way. Why would the Torah have a law prohibiting doing something unless people were doing it, right? So, uh, okay, so let's read this last paragraph before the yes, and, we'll, and then we'll stop for today. And Rabbi Elazar says, even in a place where they prohibited leaving an animal in seclusion with a Gentile, it is permitted to sell it to a Gentile. What is the reason? Once the animal is sold to the Gentile, there's no concern that he will engage in bestiality. This is because a Gentile spares his own animal from bestiality, as he does not want it to become sterile through this practice. By contrast, it's prohibited to leave one's animal in seclusion with a Gentile, as he would have no such compunction with regard to an animal belonging to others. The Gemara notes, and even Rav retracted his opinion, as Rav Tachlifa says, that Rav Shela Baravimi says, in the name of Rav, a Gentile spares his animal, as he does not want it to become sterile. So it's a, in the end, it's a problem if there are other Gentiles around because other Gentiles will take advantage of animals that don't belong to them. But their own animals, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do this too. So it's okay to sell an animal to a Gentile. Uh, so you don't. You might still have to worry about um, Shabbos, but you don't have to worry about bestiality. Okay. So we'll stop here for day for today, uh, and uh, we're on for next Sunday. And uh, let me stop. Uh, where is it here? Stop share. Um, and wish everybody a good rest of the day. And go Thank Eagles! <laughs> All right. All right. Go Bengals! <laughs> That'll be nice. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. Have a good trip. Uh, thanks.